you have your Bibles there, turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Please turn to Isaiah chapter 6. We start today a summer-long study of the book of Isaiah. My goal is that you would be reading one chapter a day, and then by the end of the summer you will have read the 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah. Um, sometimes I come up with these fancy names for these studies. Today I'm just telling you this study is just going to be Isaiah. Because the theme of Isaiah is um, one that America needs to hear. America needs to hear this desperately. But I don't want to be just for two months bashing on America when really we need to look at ourselves. Because it's a twofold kind of warning against sin and its punishment. Both the country as, at large, but then also uh, to individuals. And so if you allow me to say it today, God is warning the United States. But more importantly, he's warning you and I. He was warning in these days through Isaiah, one of the major prophets, one of the uh, more well-known prophets, the people of Israel. Okay? He, was, he, was, he was warning them as a nation. Repent or suffer the consequences. But, you know, it's easy for us to say, you know, yeah, America's got problems, America's got problems, and ignore our own problems at the same time. And so let me just say this. He wants us to repent of our sins. And if every Christian were to turn back to Christ and to give him our full um, support, our full, what's the right word, obedience... America would begin to turn around. So rather than look out there and say, well, we've got a country that's screwed up, it's got these problems, it's got these issues, we've got to fix that, they need to fix that, they need to fix this, they need to fix that. You know what, ladies and gentlemen, there are still a lot of Christians out there who have the same calling that they did back in the days of Israel to repent and to be obedient. Would you stand with me? Isaiah chapter 6. So like I told you, we're going to be going one chapter a day through the summer. I'm going to preach on just the first six chapters. So we're going to be here till about 6 o'clock tonight for dinner time. No, we're going to just talk about, just kind of summarize it a little bit. <clears throat> Some people didn't think that was very funny. They're like, yeah, you're, po you're, you're capable of doing that, Lincoln, so it's not funny. Um, and then Pastor Frank will come in, he'll read, and he will, uh, you know, just read a small section, but he'll preach on the next few chapters. If you just read one chapter a day, you should be at about Isaiah chapter 7 right now. Uh, you will have read just before it gets preached on. And I think that's important that you've already read it, because as we preach about it, uh, we're going to be summarizing a lot, putting a lot of verses together, and so it's important that you would have already read it so you have an idea of what's happening. Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the verse, voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, go and say this to the people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. 
Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and bind their eyes. Blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again. Like an oak or a stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we read these verses and we realize, Lord, that it it goes back and forth from looking forward to what you're going to do someday in your second coming and beyond to what can happen right here, right now if we don't repent. And back again to prophecy and back again to the here and now. And so, Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to be able to understand. Lord, your word says that we can only understand it with your help, with your interpretation, with your direction. So help us then to apply what we read as we read this summer and we look at a very difficult book in some ways. Lord, help us to apply this to where we're at now and to realize that not only as a nation but as people, we need to turn back to God. And we need to come back to you and to remember that while, Lord, there's a lot of big things that need to change out there, our hearts need to change first. Our obedience needs to change first. And I just pray that this summer-long study would focus us on doing what we should do, doing what we can do, doing our part, and bringing revival to your land. Lord, we love you, and thank you for the opportunity to study your word together. For it's in your very precious name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Maybe seated. So many good titles for these verses that we're going to look at. I just put what I saw over and over as I read these verses. The same things happen today in America today, in our own lives today. Compromise and pride. Compromise and pride. Let's start because as I prayed just a minute ago, let's remember, let's try to set a groundwork for what we're going to be studying this summer, the book of Isaiah. As you read these words, it's going to flip back and forth and you're going to get confused at times. It's going to go from prophecy that talks about the end times, what's going to happen someday when Jesus comes again, because he is coming again. Okay? Don't get discouraged just because it's not coming at your timetable. He is coming again. I know that feeling. I get discouraged sometimes. I say to Jesus sometimes, when, O Lord, when? And I'm reminded... Uh, You're Lincoln, I'm God, let me take care of that. Amen? He knows the timing. So he's going to go back and forth in this book between, uh, even in the midst of verses, in in the same verse sometimes, talking about future prophecy that is, by the way, batting 1,000% in the Bible. All prophecy has come true. Everything they said was going to come true has come true so far. So far, Jesus is batting 1,000. He always does. And then it'll switch in the same verse back to, and if Israel, if you don't get your act together, you are about to get punished. And back and forth and back and forth. But it ought to serve as a reminder to behave as we should now, knowing that Jesus is going to come again. So in some ways it makes sense that he would go back and forth, back and forth. We just have to understand what he's referring to each time so we know what he's saying to us. Another thing we need to remember as we do this study is, where is Isaiah in the history of the Israelites? Let's look at that real quickly, because it'll lead to our first big point today. Today's sermon is just going to lay the groundwork. It's just big generalizations that you already know. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know today. So if you were coming to say, like, you know, Lincoln's going to reveal some kind of hidden truth, uh, you're going to be disappointed. I'm going to give you some groundwork that we're going to build on as we study this throughout the the summer. But God began his relationship with the Jews when he made a covenant with Abraham. Remember that covenant that he made with Abraham? And, And it remained through Isaac and through Jacob and then the 12 tribes. Remember this? Remember this story? 
Trust me, I'm getting to a point with Isaiah, so stay with me. The 12 tribes were led out of Egypt by Moses, yes? Let my people go. Right, remember? So they're led out of Egypt by Moses after 40 years in the wilderness because, well, they're boneheads. After 40 years in the wilderness, first generation has to die, minus Joshua and Caleb. And the second generation gets to go in. They go into the promised land, and, uh, and they're under the lead of Joshua. When Joshua died, a little side script here. That's what we're studying in a Bible study on Sunday mornings. If you don't know enough about Joshua, get up early and get here. What's wrong with you? All right? So anyways, so uh, when Joshua died, some dark days came. Period of judges was evil for around 300 years with some bright, uh, small bright spots, namely like Ruth, Boaz, people like that. Bright spots here and there. And this, this woman, Ruth, gave uh, uh, birth to Obed, who was the father of Jesse. Remember Jesse? Hmm? David's dad? You, hear where, you see how all this connects? Okay. Toward the end of the judges, this prophet named Samuel rises up, and he calls Israel back to God, and things seem to be going well. But Israel saw some inconsistencies in Samuel's family. Remember, he had some sons that were a little, uh, little shady, if you allow me to put it in my words. And so they cry out for a king. They didn't need a king, but they wanted to be like the rest of the world. So God says, okay. Sort of like mom and dad do sometimes. All right, I'm going to give you a little taste of what you want. You're asking for it, I'm going to let you have a little bit of what you want. And so he gives them the kings. Remember? And so this starts uh, Samuel anoints Samuel. I mean, pardon me, Samuel anoints Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Saul reigns for about 40 years. Saul's got a bunch of issues. That's a whole other set of uh, sermons there. And then Saul, after Saul comes, David, David, Samuel anoints David too, remember? He's the one in the back, that's a great series of studies there, about how all the good looking guys and the handsome guys, and then there's David out in the back, and he's the young guy, who ends up being very handsome too, but at that time, he's just the young little shepherd boy, kind of, you know, he's kind of the scraps. First Samuel chapter 16, he is anointed, and he reigns for 40 years, and then David's son Solomon is anointed, remember Solomon? He's supposed to be the smartest man that ever lived. I'm going to beg to differ here in a second. He's anointed in 1 Kings chapter 1. Solomon reigned for 40 years also. But Solomon, your outline there, if you've ever got one in the back, Solomon began this kind of like, what well, didn't begin with Solomon, pardon me, but Solomon is a great example of this cycle that we see in the Israelites and we see in our own lives that's going to eventually lead to why Isaiah came. And it's this cycle of we're blessed, we're doing so many good things, God is good, amen? And then we fail, we get a little prideful, we compromise in our lives and uh, we sin and then we are punished and then we have to go back and we have to ask for forgiveness and God restores us and then we go in this cycle and, you know, we just do this over and over. Solomon's a great example of that. He's supposed to be the smartest man that ever lived. And yet, towards the end of his life, he allowed a lot of idolatry. He compromised. Christians, I don't know if there's very many uh, words that are more dangerous than the word compromise. He compromised. Here's a guy who the Lord just said, okay, boom, you are super smart. Wouldn't you love God to do that for you today? Have you walked into the bedroom and forgot why you walked into the bedroom this week? Have you walked in and looked for your glasses and they were right here the whole time? You looked, spent 20, 10 minutes looking for your glasses and they were right here on your head? Solomon, boom, smart. And yet, towards the end of his life, he begins to compromise. And I can prove to you he was compromising for quite a while in his life because he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Wow. I'm not even going to go there, okay? And these wives and concubines began bringing in a lot of idol worship, and he just allows it to happen. Compromise. Pride. I wonder how much pride came in because Solomon was so doggone smart. People were coming there telling him how smart he was and how awesome things were and how beautiful things were and how amazing his... Th and then pretty soon he starts feeling pretty, what, what do they say? Pretty big for his britches? Too big for his britches? You know how we feel after, you know, lunch today? 
feels too big for his britches and some pride comes in. And, and you know, in his old age, he starts to, 1 Kings chapter 11, he starts to uh, pull away from God a little bit. And God says, okay, I'm going to tear the nation of Israel in two. I'm going to tear this nation in Israel in two and tear it from his sons. And so Jeroboam ends up ruling over the ten tribes. Remember the split? The ten tribes of the north, Israel, okay? Capital city, Samaria. Remember how they have problems in the New Testament, especially with Samaritans? Remember, all this is coming from that? So you have the Samaritans up in the north. And then the Rehoboam was a king in the south of the southern in Judah, the capital city of Jerusalem. Okay, the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, make up the, you know, the, the, the south of Judah. And the north is taken captive by the Assyrians, and their wickedness happens because of their wickedness. And the southern kingdom, about, I don't know, three, 350 years later or something like that, they, they get taken over. Uh, you know, there's just this, this, and, and, and then this Judah has a little bit longer. The, the north went negative. They went sinful quickly. The south has some, a good king, a bad king, a good king, a bad king, a good king, a bad king. And so slowly but surely, they're finally then taken over. Those kings, Uzziah, kind of starts the king, Uzziah, starts this, his son, Jotham, Jotham came in. He was a good king. Ahaz was the bad king. Hezekiah was a good king. Manasseh was the bad king. And in this, this reign of Uzziah, at the end of, toward the end of his life, is the, is the, is the time at which Isaiah starts coming up. And most of Isaiah, he was there at the end of Uzziah's reign, but most of the time that, that Isaiah is there, that he's telling Israel to repent. He's telling Israel to repent. He's telling Israel to repent. Happens during those four kings. Jotham, the, the son of Uzziah. Isaiah, uh, he had started good, went bad. Then you have Jotham. Then you have Ahaz, so good, bad. Hezekiah, good. Manasseh, bad. And so he, he's during this time. That's Isaiah's time. You get me? So they've had the split, and, and they're about to be taken over. And you have Isaiah coming in here and saying, guys, if you don't repent, talking about the south, most of Isaiah's work is with the south, with Judah. And so he's down here saying, guys, you've got to repent. If you don't repent, do you not see what happened in the north? Do you not see what happened with those people? You've got to repent. It'd be like someone coming to America and saying, do you not see what's happening around the world? If you don't start doing what God has called you to do, if you don't start behaving like we should, do you not see what's going to happen? The same things that are happening around the world are going to happen to us if we don't come back to God. And guess what? You are the person called to do that, to claim that, to call that, to remind people of that in your house, in your neighborhood, in your workplace. You are the Isaiah calling people, telling people, reminding them. If you don't get back behaving the way you should, you are going to pay, and it's going to be a heavy cost. No amen on that one. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. If you're a Christian and you sin, you are still going to pay a cost. And you need to hear that if you don't repent, and if you don't come back to the way God calls you to behave, you will pay a heavy price. Started me thinking and this kind of like laying the groundwork for this study this, this summer. Isaiah is just telling us something that we already know. You know what? It doesn't matter. Anything else doesn't. All this other junk. We focus on so many things. Number one thing to remember this summer as we study this book. The only thing that really matters is obeying God. I, I wanna, let, me, let me just prove that to you. You can have all the wisdom in the world... Like Solomon. When did he get screwed up? When he started disobeying. God told him specifically, do not get wives from these places. Do not cohabitate or deal with these countries. Eh, he compromised. Ah, come on. Reminds me of the serpent. I mean, did he really say? Is that really what he meant? I mean, maybe reinterpret. Don't reinterpret the Bible. Don't interpret... Just let the Bible say what it says and do what it says. Obey it. Don't, don't compromise and say, well, you know, I'm going to apply part of this, but part of this I'm not. No, no. Guys, read what God's Word says and obey it. That's all that matters. And I don't care if you have all the brains like, uh, like Solomon. You can have all the good looks. You know, I found three verses just like that that talked about how good-looking David was. 
Boy, David was a handsome stud. Boy, he was good looking. He had all the looks. And oh man, he was a fighter. Saul's killed thousands, but David's killed his tens of thousands. So not only was, it good, was he good looking, but he was a stud. I mean, this guy, whoo. And when did his problems come? When he disobeyed God. So you can have all the brains like Solomon. You can have all the looks and all the toughness like David. And you can be born into the right family like all these kings were. The son of this guy became the king, became the king. The son became the king. The next son became the king. You could be born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Getting like everything handed to you. These guys, everything was handed to them. The father said, guess what? Just because you were born, you're going to be king. You could be given all the opportunity in the world, and it didn't change anything. What mattered was obedience. You say, well, if I just had the brains of Solomon. You don't need the brains of Solomon. You need to obey God. If I just had, you know, some of the charismatic, like, good looks and all the stuff that David had, you don't need that. Just obey God. Well, if I just had, look at so-and-so over here. He's got it so easy. Just obey God. We are so funny the way we look over and we see the grass is greener. I was thinking about this the other day as I was driving. I, I do this. I'm guilty of this. Okay, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just going to admit my fault here. I, I'm a guilty of this as I'm driving by saying when I see somebody, they need to mow their yard. <laughs> driving by, they need, to do, they need to edge the grass. They need to trim that tree. That stuff bugged me. Okay, it's a weakness. But I was looking at somebody's yard, and I could see it from a distance, and I'm like, oh, wow, that looks good. It looks really green. Because I was looking at it from an angle. I wasn't close up. Are you with me? I was seeing kind of the tops of the grass. And as I got closer, I realized, oh, holy mackerel, this yard is in bad shape. And as I got right up next to it, I realized, man, this yard is dead. It looked green from about half a block away. But when I got real close, I realized, you've got some big issues. We see people like this all the time. I just wish I had this. I wish I had that. I wish I had this. And God's like, hey, trust me. Just obey me. You don't want what he has. You don't want what she has. You don't want that. You know what you want to do? You want to obey. You could have all of that stuff. You could have all of these things, all these things that the world has to offer. And at the end of the day, all that matters is obeying God. Isaiah is going to say this over and over and over. I don't care if you're taken over. I don't care if you've been made slaves. I don't care what's happened. I don't care what's going on. I don't care if it's Assyrians, Babylonians. I don't care if it's what. I don't care who it is. I don't care what's happening. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care what happens at the stock market. I don't care about what, you know, the newest health issue you have. We all got issues. We're all messed up. Here's all that matters. Obey God. Are you with me? Do you hear what I'm saying? And you're going to hear this over and over and over during this study. I found a couple. There's just some fantastic quotes. I named, I, I quoted a couple here and in your outline uh, there. Uh, George Washington. Remember when, our, remember when our president had no problem standing up and quoting the Bible? Hmm. George Washington said, the, the Christian man must aim at, no, pardon me. The whole duty of man is summed up in obedience to God's will. The whole duty of man, your whole job is to follow God's will. Can you imagine if a politician, I don't care, left side, right side, I don't care, middle side, I don't care what side. Can you imagine if any politician got up there today and said, hey, the only thing that matters in America today is doing God's will. They'd be impeached the next day. I don't think they would have even got voted in. William Barclay said this, the Christian man must aim at complete obedience to God. See, as Christians, we like to pick and choose where we're going to obey. God says, it don't work like that. You don't get to pick and choose where you're going to obey. Do you understand? The old hymn that we used to sing did not say, trust and pick where you want to obey, for there's no other way. That's not the hymn. It was just trust and obey. Period. Amen? He goes on and he says this. The Christian man must aim at that, comple aim at that complete obedience to God in which life finds its highest happiness. You mean if I obey God, I have more happiness and joy in my life? 
church. Yeah. Yeah. It's greatest good. You ever felt like you're just doing nothing? You're not accomplishing anything? You're not doing any good with your life? Listen, obey God and watch your life bring on greater meaning. You ever got up in the morning and been like, I don't think anyone would notice if I didn't get up. I don't think anyone would notice if I didn't exist. Well, number one, okay, quit your whining, okay? Number two, uh, yes, you want meaning? Follow God. And you will make an impact in the people around you. Three amens. Hey, wake up, people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What brings meaning to life is obedience to God. Not being enshrined in the Hall of Fame. Not being, you know, your name being on the back of a dollar bill. Not being known by all these people. Not getting big awards and, you know, accolades and all this stuff. You want to bring in meaning in your life. You want to bring in happiness in your life. More joy to your life. Follow God. Obey God. And your life will just begin to turn up. It's perfect consummation. It's peace. You want more peace in your life? Follow God's will. You want to know why your life feels like it's going crazy? It's because it's your life and not God's. When you start realizing it's God, that you belong to God and you got to follow God, all of a sudden things start becoming a little more peaceful. I didn't say things got easier. I didn't say, you know, all of a sudden you have no problems. I'm saying all those problems you have, all of a sudden now... God takes them on. You realize, oh, God's that. He's got that. He's in control. Oh, God's got that. And he just gives you peace. And the New Testament is called the peace that passes all understanding. I don't even know why. I don't know how I'm being peaceful in this moment. I don't know how I'm not stressing out. But for some reason, I'm just, I'm just trusting God. It's called being obedient. It's all about obedience. Well, so Isaiah saw this great need in the people. And for this entire book, all 66 books, they, some people call Isaiah like the little Bible in the middle of the Bible. There's 66 books in the Bible. There's 66 chapters in Isaiah. There's other similarities. You know, it's just a really, a really a powerful book, okay? But uh, he saw this spiritual need. He saw this great need. It was a spiritual lacking or a, a weakness in the people of Judah, mostly. Most of his ministry was to the people of Judah. And so he warned them. That if they did not stop sinning, they were going to be punished. Now, if you allow me to go off onto a little tangent here, well, you don't have a choice, so deal with it. Okay, here we go. When we sin, there are consequences. And the best thing we can do to teach our next generation is to understand that there is accountability to their actions. Sometimes we don't want to be accountable for our own actions, but we need to be accountable and we need to teach those coming up behind us that they are accountable because there are consequences to our actions. We need to remember that. We need to remember, even as a Christian, and I don't care how old you are, whether you're 12 or 112, how long you've been saved, I don't care. I don't care if you're a pastor. I don't care if you're the first-time visitor. I don't care who, who you are. When we sin, there will be consequences. And you need to hear that. I'm not doing my job if I don't tell you that. And you're not doing your job if you're not telling others that. Because you have that same job. You have that same responsibility. And so Isaiah realized that, you know, at the end of Uzziah, during that reign, Isaiah, Uzziah is a king that started out really good. Okay, he started out really good. He was listening to the godly advice of Zechariah, one of the other prophets that was right before Isaiah. And, and you know, 2 Kings chapter 15, 2 Chronicles chapter 26. And he's doing great. And there's some great things. And he's listening to God and he's doing some great things. But here's what happened to Uzziah. He started to get a little cocky. He started getting a little prideful. He, you know, he'd, done, he'd done really well. And he'd had some successes. You hear me? He'd done really well. And then he started getting a little prideful. And so um, pride kind of started taking over. And in 2 Chronicles, we're not going to, for time's sake, look at that, but in 2 Chronicles chapter 26 is the story of when Uzziah got a little arrogant and he got a little impatient. Boy, isn't it funny how it seems like 
in stories of sin, the word impatience comes up often. But anyways, I digress. So, and he enters the temple, and he decides to burn incense. Now, this is part of their um, ritual that they did in those days. We wouldn't necessarily understand all of that because we don't have those same rituals, right? I didn't ask you to burn any incense when you came in today. All right? Okay, I can't even stand perfume, so don't do that. All right? And so he came, you know, so he, he came in, he decided to burn the incense, which was the job of the priests. He kind of took on some other job. You know, God has a specific calling on your life. But when you say, you know what, I think I'm good enough, I could do this, or I could do better, you are asking for trouble. Look for God's will for your life and learn to enjoy that. Stay in your lane. Y-O lane. Your spiritual lane. God has called you to something. He's given you a specific calling. Yes? You have a mission. You have a purpose. There's a reason you're here. If you don't know it, you better start praying for it. Because there is a reason God has you here. And you need to get in it and do it. And you will find your joy. I didn't say it's going to be easy. Satan's still going to attack. Satan's still around. He's still going to attack and, you know, he's still there. But you will find joy. Uzziah started getting out of his comfort zone. Got a little too big for his britches. There it is again. You're going to go home. You're going to say that this week because I got that in your mind right now. And so he decides to light this incense. And then all of a sudden, earthquake comes. The temple's, the temple's ripped. Okay? And immediately he falls down with leprosy. Boom! I'm not promising you you're going to get leprosy, but I will tell you this, uh, God doesn't play around. I, I don't know if I'm supposed to always talk like this, but I think sometimes it is appropriate for me to say it. God does not play games. God is not mocked. You know that little sin that you've been dabbling with and kind of back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and you're kind of keeping it quiet, you think nobody knows? God doesn't play games. You better get it right. You better get it right before it explodes into something bigger. And before it becomes something where God has to really punish you to get your attention. Amen? You better get it right. God got his attention, boy. And so pretty much that's when Jotham, his, uh, Jotham, his son, became king and the prophet Isaiah began to speak up and that's when he had this vision that we read in Isaiah chapter 6 this morning. This vision that went back and forth to, you know, eternal, not pardon me, not eternal, but the, the end times kind of stuff. Jesus is coming again, tribulation, I mean, all that stuff, you know, the end times, because Jesus is coming again. And we're going to go to heaven, and then we're going to come back at the end of seven years, and we're going to be in the back, and we're going to be ready to battle, but we're not going to need to battle because God's going to fight the battle and win the battle without us. It's called Armageddon, and he's going to wipe them out. It's going to be a perfect thousand years, and then there's going to be that season, and then we're going to reign forever with him. It's happening. It's not just movies. It's real stuff. It's real stuff. Let me think about that Uzziah, when, when Isaiah came to, and again, here's the, the groundwork for our whole study, because this is what's happening not just to King Uzziah, but it also happens to us today. Pride destroys anyone who falls to it. Pride will win every time. If you think, if you think, I'm going to go further. Every single one of us has a problem with some type of pride. You say, no, 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 no. I don't have pride. I'll tell you. I think sometimes some people don't even see pride as a sin. I think Satan tries to convince people today that pride is good and it's not a sin. Now, I'm not talking about pride like the pride month. Okay, so get over that. I ain't talking about that. That's a whole other issue. Amen? Okay, I'm talking about pride, the sin of pride. Okay? Sometimes, let me, let me just prove to you that we all, I'm going to give you different types of pride. 
and this is not all of them, but this is looking in three different commentaries, that I, two different commentaries and one website that I could find that I trusted that, that I think gives us some good ideas of how, um, how much pride enters in our lives. And I want to prove to you that every single one of us has a problem with pride. I don't care if you're one of these people that thinks, you know, you're no good and you're garbage and you're worthless and all of this stuff, which, why would Jesus create or die on the cross for garbage? But anyways, that's a whole other issue. So if you're one of these people that thinks you have no good, can't do anything good, I'm telling you we all have some issue with pride. I'm going to tell you some of that is pride. Some of that in this overly I'm too humble, I'm, too, I'm no good for anything, that's pride. I'm going to show you. Yeah, but uh, anybody have a trouble with always wanting to be in charge or being in control? Don't laugh and look at someone else. That's pride. You ever feel superior to others? Or, I know you wouldn't say it because everybody would think you're a jerk, but in your mind you think, oh, Lord, I'd never wear that. What are they driving? Have they lost their minds? What are they... What are they listening to? What are they watching? Pride. Pride. Assuming... We should be chosen for something over someone else. You ever felt like, boy, they messed up on that one. I was the right person to choose. Bride! Huh. You ever thought that way about God? Why has God got that person there? I should be the one that... You ever think that maybe God's got a better plan than you have? You ever thought of that? Expecting. Here's one. Having to get the last word in. You know anybody that every time you say something, they got to have the last word? It doesn't matter what's said. They got something else to say. Pride. Why, why do they think they need the last word? Sometimes it's completely random and clueless because they have no idea what you're talking about, but they're going to pretend like they do. You ever, you ever talk to anyone who always knows something about everything? They're an expert in everything. Pride. Expecting special treatment because of your rank or your status. No, I'll just get in because, you know, I've got this badge. I, I remember one time, one time a friend of mine got me concert tickets. The only time it's ever happened to me. And, and when I got there, it was a special VIP. Anybody ever gotten the VIP? And they gave me a badge. When I got a lanyard and I got a badge... And I could walk everywhere I wanted to except on the stage. You hear what I'm saying? Now, a couple of them, I thought I could go on the stage better than them. But that's my own pride. Okay? Okay. I got the VIP pass. And I'm telling you, throughout the night, I was like, you know, every once in a while I'd look over and be like, yeah, that's right. Make sure you see that. Make sure you see it. Did you see it? Somebody walked by. Somebody walked by. Make sure people saw, because I got the badge, because I felt important. I felt important. Yeah. Pride. Pride, pride, pride. How about, have you ever looked at others and thought, well, they don't really know because they're not as educated? I got news for you. Some of the dumbest people I know are the most educated people. Some of the most sinful people I know have like three PhDs, X, Y, Z, W, X, M, N, O, P, Q, whatever after the names. And they're the dumbest, most sinful, selfish people. Arrogant, blowhard, like I don't even want to listen to them. They all, and they got to throw around every, have you ever been around people that got to throw around every acronym? They got to throw around, I got the ABC because I've been to the LBT and at the LBQ and then the MNO. And the, I'm like, dude, just speak English. Huh? Pride. How about you look down on someone else because they have a different political view than you? Maybe they're wrong. But to look down on them because they're wrong is pride. Because guess what? You're wrong sometimes too. I know that's hard to hear. Here's one I've done. Driving along. See a bumper sticker. Says they voted for so-and-so. And my lip goes, hmm. 
that's pride. Do you hear me, people? That's pride. How dare they decide to vote different than Lincoln? That's pride. That's not okay. I don't care if they are wrong. I don't care if I'm wrong. It doesn't matter. It's still pride. That's a sin. They have a different opinion than me, therefore they're wrong. Like, come on. That's pride. That's pride. How about uh, maybe they go to the poor school or they go to the poor place to shop? I'd never noticed this. And I remember one time, uh, many years ago, I was teaching in someone and I said something about, uh, I said, I can't remember what it was. It was some silly thing. It was one of, the stu- it was one of my students. And I said, oh, I'm going to have to go after school, go to Walmart and get one of those because I don't have it. And they said, oh, coach, go to Target. Don't go to Walmart. And they looked at me like, I thought you were better than that. That's pride. Amen. I mean, that's just silly. But have we done it? I, like, I laugh at these people. They will go shop at like a, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a fancy one. How about a Coach? I can't think of another one. One of these fancy brands, yeah? You know one that sells you a purse that's worth about 98 cents, but they charge you $500. You know what I'm talking about. And they get a bag, so they spent $500, and they get the Coach bag. And they use that Coach bag for lunch at work, for carrying their clothes to the swimming pool, for, they use it as, a, as a, a suitcase on the plane for their snacks. They use that bag for the next 10 years. So everyone can see, one time I bought something at Coach. Get, you're taping on the inside, keeping it together just so that no one notices that it's 10-year-old bag. Pride, people. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying it's bad to go buy something that's expensive or something if it's good quality. Whatever. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying why do we do what we do? That's pride. You say, well, none of this has been me yet. Well, yes, it has, but I'll give you some more. How about not bothering? Oh boy, what if I decided? What if I decided not to study for my sermon and I just came up here and, and read it and then just kind of told you what came off the top of my head? That'd be lazy, number one, but it'd be prideful that I could even do that, that I could even try to give you what God's Word says. I prepare sometimes way more than I did this week, and I still am unprepared because God's Word is that awesome. So if you go at something and you don't prepare because you're like, no, I got this, I'm good, I'm all right. That's prideful. And I don't care how good you are. You might be the best in your field. You ain't perfect. You better prepare. And if you don't prepare, that's prideful. You hear me? Nothing gets me more angry than teachers who walk into a classroom. Okay, I am off on a tangent here, so just stay with me. Teachers who walk into a classroom and they think, oh, no, I know how to do this. I did this back in sixth grade. I don't need to prepare. You ever, you ever stood in front of 25 sixth graders? They will eat you for lunch. You better be prepared. Very little has to do with, do you understand the material? You better be prepared, keep them busy, because if they're not busy, by the middle of the period, they will have you burning at a stake in the middle of the classroom. You better be prepared, amen? You better be prepared. Not bothering to prepare is, you know, pride. Looking down on others because they're part of a certain group. Looking down on others because they're not part of a certain group. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to joke. Me and my man, Trav, we're talking about a new gym that's in town. I ain't going to say no names. I choose not to say the name. <laughs> okay, but anyways, somebody said to me the other day, uh, you're still going to the gym over there? Five o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm not a morning person, okay? It's about seven o'clock before I realize what my middle name is. I, I'm, I'm just not a morning person, okay? So five o'clock in the morning, I'm like, and they said, the person was like, you're still going here all the time? They had to come here that day because of something in their schedule. I don't know. They had to like, you know, come down with us, you know, bottom feeders or something. And so, you know, you're still coming here to this place? 
Yeah. I'm, seriously? I mean, can't, can't you just make a choice to go to one or the other that's better for you rather than looking down on someone else who makes a different choice? You're still driving that car? You still live there? My parents still live in the same house that they lived in when I was a little kid, long before there was a Wendy or Tony. That's how long ago it was. I still live there. And I'll hear people say, your parents still live there? Yeah, what are you trying to say? Like, we get these names of cities and we decide, oh, you got to live here because, you know, this city's no good. And that's it. Pride, pride, pride. Mixed in with a little racism and other things, too. Pride. Pride, 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 pride. Having instant contempt or hatred for someone because you're walking by them at the mall and they have a shirt on that has a slogan on that you don't like and all of a sudden you've decided you've got them all figured out because of their t-shirt and therefore you're looking down on them. And, Ugh. That's pride. You don't know nothing about them. It could be they're like me and they don't even realize what they're wearing until about halfway through the day. It could be that that's all they have. It could be that they have no idea what that even means. It could be that they have a different point of view, and it still doesn't mean you're better than them. That's, there's no reason for pride. Huh? Boy, I remember when I was a kid. Boy, when I grew up, there were two kinds of people. There were those that wore vans, and were those that did not. And those that wore vans were cool, and then there was the rest of us. Pride, pride, pride. You hear what I'm saying? Oh, we're learning early in life. Be proud. Pride about stuff. What about some religious garb? When was the last time you walked by somebody and they had some kind of religious garb on and you got an attitude about, and you don't even know what they believe? Maybe it's just because, you know what, they don't want any sun. You don't even know what they believe, but you've got an attitude because they've got some kind of, you know, garb on. And you figure, well, they're not Christian. i got news for you. Jesus died for terrorists, non-terrorists, died for people in the Middle East, America, Canada, Russia, Japan, Yugoslavia. Well, I, don't, I don't know why I'm pointing this way as Yugoslavia, but where every country, every which way. Jesus died for all of them. Here we go. I'm going to step on more toes, so get ready. Here we go. This, this bugs me, and I think this is something we need to think about. Self-esteem can become pride. Because we live in a day where we say, you know, we've got to have self-esteem. We've got to feel better about ourselves. Why? Is that always what I need? Is that what I need to do every day is feel better about myself, really? Because at some point, um, I need to recognize I'm a sinner. At some point, I need to stop thinking how great I am and start realizing I'm a sinner. And I'm screwed up and I need to fix some stuff. Some of you guys are in education. You know what? Self-esteem is in every sentence. Like every other thing somebody says is something about we got to build up self-esteem, self-esteem, self-esteem. So everybody's being bullied. Everybody's being hurt. and Blah, blah, blah. Oh, Oh, just stop. Okay, just stop. No wonder we're raising a country of people who think that they know all and they're in charge and all that matters is what they think because they've been told from day one that all matters is they feel good about themselves and not think at all at one time that maybe they made a mistake or they could sin. We all sin every day. And so, you know, self-esteem. Now listen. I put on here, if self esteem I want to read it this way because I tried to word it the right way. I'm not saying all self-esteem is bad, but I'm telling you that it's like anything else. You go home and have a Twinkie, that's good. You go home and eat a box of Twinkies, that's bad. Are you with me? Like there's got to be a balance. Are you hearing me, people? I'm pretty sure Peter and Paul 
and, and Mary, the whole band, I don't know, is going to hand us... It's going to hand us a Twinkie when we enter heaven. I'm, God, is, God loves Twinkies. But listen, what I'm telling you, that's not in the Bible, that's from Lincoln. But what I'm telling you is this. Too much is bad. Okay, so I tried to write this correctly. If self-esteem elevates success over well-being or leads you to have favorites or, here we go, blame others for one's issues in a relationship, or put down others by comparison, if self-esteem takes you to that point where now you're looking at others and putting them down, racism, classism, sexism, all the isms, okay? Or you put down others, or to think highly of yourself because you, your value, and you get your value by looking at others. So you look at others and how they're having trouble, and you find your value in putting them down. Oh, there's a lot of that in America, isn't there? You find your value by saying how, how someone else is a schmuck. We're all schmucks. The United States of schmucks. That's who we are. We're all sinners. Okay? We're all sinners. Okay? If that's what it does, and you overvalue your contribution to a group... Okay, let me just say this. I've said this to you before. I want you to hear this again, but I want you to know this is not false like... Humility. This is honesty right here in this thing. Um, if, if I die, this is God's church. And it, we're doing God's work. And you've got to say, oh, too bad. He's gone. Bury me and move on. Because God's work's got to continue. This is not Lincoln's church. This is not your church. This is God's church. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter who you are. At the end of the day, all that matters is Jesus. So to keep feeling better about myself, at some point, I'm going to get higher than Jesus. And no one belongs there, buddy. No one. No one. How about, how about, how about bullying? Oh, man, I'm not even going to go there. I don't got enough time in the morning. I'm so sick and tired of the word bullying. How about, how about, uh, Becoming defensive. Oh, there's one I, I struggle with. Get defensive. That's a form of pride. Are you hearing me? Admit that you can listen and hear ideas and agree or disagree and change and get better and don't be defensive. It's not about you anyway. It's about Christ. And if someone else is making it about you, well, they're wrong. They're the ones sinning. It's about Jesus. How about narcissistic? You know, the world revolves around you. It's all about you. It's how it affects you. It's how you feel. How about arrogant, conceited? You know, in... God's work today, there's some amazing, amazing, talented people. God has gifted people with some amazing gifts. When they fall is where they, re they stop realizing that that is from God and they start thinking it's themselves. That's pride. I found some of the laziest Christians I know are the most talented Christians, the most gifted Christians. The most gifted, the smartest, the, the, the wisest, the most intelligent are the, the laziest, arrogant, prideful. They don't need to work hard because they'll always figure it out because they got it. That's pride, people. That's pride. Mm. I got others here. I want to move on. Pride is an issue that these people were dealing with in Israel. That's what caused them to sin. Often it caused them to sin because they felt like they knew better than what God had taught them. They felt like better, like Solomon. I figured out a better way. I've been so smart for so long. I got a better way. I figured it out. Listen, guys, you are not going to find out a better way than what is right here. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how many books you've written. You are not going to find anything better than what is put right here. And to try to do it another way is pride. It's pride. It's pride. Hmm. That leads us to the verses that we read today. 
And we'll kind of wrap up with these verses that were read today. These verses that we read today is a series, could be a series of sermons in themselves. Maybe we'll go back to these verses sometime. But our, our goal is to get through the book, so we'll just kind of touch on them here, kind of just briefly. But what he says in these is he says, you know, Lord, here I am. Amen? He says, here I am. It's, it, this, these verses remind me that serving our God is an awesome responsibility. You have an awesome responsibility. You have a privilege that people don't understand that are not saved, and many people who are saved don't realize it. It is a privilege to serve Jesus Christ. Isaiah is saying, like, do you understand? Look at verse 8 again, please. Look at verse 8, because I'm not getting enough amens. I don't think you're listening. Okay, here we go. Ready? That was pride, sorry. I was messing around with you, sorry. Here we go. And I heard the verse of the Lord, the voice of the Lord saying, who am I going to send? Who's going to go for us? And then I said, what? Here I am. Send me. See, a lot of Christians, their answer to that is, uh, Lincoln's right over there on Grove Street. Go find him, Lord. Who are you going to send? I would call Pastor Frank, Lord, because, you know, he's good at such and such. No, 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 no. Your response should be like, Lord, if there's something to do, send me. Because it's going to come from him anyway. The talent that you're going to have, the gifts that you're going to have, the ability to do it comes from him anyway. So here I am. Send me. That's beautiful, isn't it? He understands. He's not saying it's easy. He's not saying it's fun. He's not even saying that he likes it or is looking forward to it. What? What? Yeah, that's right. God calls you to do things sometimes that are not what you want to do. Suck it up. God calls you to do things sometimes that's not what you want to do. You understand? I'm 54. I have still not played third base for the Dodgers. God says, that is not my plan, so give it up. You hear what I'm saying? God doesn't promise you you're going to get to do what you want to do. got to be willing to serve. That's beautiful. I love that. I love that. He says, here I am. Send me. But notice where that attitude started. And this is what I want us to close in. And we come back full circle with the idea about pride. Notice in verse 8, he says, God says, who am I going to send? Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. But that's not where it started. Isaiah didn't just wake up in the morning and say, man, I'm good. I'm going to serve God all the time. I'm great. Everything's wonderful. Peachy, kino, hunky, dory, everything's great. Look back at verse 5. Same chapter, verse 5. Look back at verse 5. And I said, woe is me. I am a sinner. I have problems. Woe, broken. I am messed up. I have issues. I need to get better. I am, woe is me, for I am lost, and I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I am messed up. I'm a sinner. I live in the, you know, there's some people that you can literally tell them and show them, this is a sin, you did this, and they will come back with an excuse why they did it. They can't admit that they sinned. Christians, we need to say, woe is me. I am a sinner. I am messed up. That's where it started. He admitted that he was a sinner and he had mistakes and he had faults. He didn't say, I'm perfect. He didn't say, I got it all together. He didn't say, Lord, you can send me after I go to seminary and get trained. He didn't say, Lord, you could send me, but listen, I just got to get some bills paid first. Let me, let me get some things right. Remember Jesus in the New Testament? Lord, I, I got to go back and take care of uh, some, you know, funeral arrangements. He said, man, let the dead take care of the dead. We got work to do. We, we have work to do today. We have work to do today. Stop giving me excuses. Stop saying, well, when I get older. Uh, I got news for you. 
Nothing gets easier as you get older. I used to think that when I was a kid. Things are going to get better when I get... Now I wish I could go back to like, you know, 1985. I wish I could listen to Huey Lewis in the news all day, watch Back to the Future, and just go back to 1985. I keep waking up and it don't happen. Apparently he's not hit the DeLorean for my date because it's not happening. Amen? But here's the, here's, the, here's the secret of it. I got something better than going back to my favorite days and just following God today. If I can just follow God today, I'm going to have something better than I could. If you go back to your favorite day of your whole life, God's got something new and great for you if you'll just obey him now. But you got to start with saying, I'm broken. I am a sinner. I'm messed up. Woe is me. And then you could say, now, oh, send me, Lord, because here I am. Mistakes. Sins, faults, and all. When I was a kid, every other Sunday, you'd lose your Baptist card if you didn't sing Just As I Am for the invitation. Remember that one? Boy, that song was great. The words are powerful. Sing me. Here I am, Lord, just as I am. Screwed up, faults, sensitive, uh, issues, uh, you know, sins, and all. Lord, I know I messed up. I'm going to trust you to help me with those. Use me where you want me to be used. Like you could prepare for everything that's going to happen anyway. No matter what it is, you've got to get in there and start serving. You've got to get in there and start doing what God's called you to do. That verse 5 tells us that the only way to serve God correctly is to begin on your knees, to begin on the ground worshiping God, recognizing that He is holy and that we are absolutely broken. Now God can use you. Amen? David had everything going for him. Everything was going great. And he fell. He messed up. When he was broken and he was hurting and he was on his knees and he was crying for his baby to be saved and the baby died. And he got up and he brushed himself up and he said, glory to God, uh, let's go on, I'm going to serve God. The people around him said, this dude is, has lost his mind. And he's like, no, I realize I made the mistakes, I was broken, I messed up and I'm willing to suffer, I'm willing to take whatever God's got, but I'm his to be used. Never was he any more powerful or any more useful when he realized he was broken and messed up and he said, God, just use me like I am. Help me to get better. Help me to serve you where I'm at. So I'm not so-and-so. I don't have this. I don't have that. God didn't make you to be so-and-so. That's why you're unique. That's why he made you the way you are. He gave you the gifts that you have and you have gifts that other people don't have. You understand? You have things that God that he doesn't understand, that, that, that you and I don't understand. God's giving you gifts that we don't even get. I, I, was, I was going upstairs. I walked upstairs. And I was watching Gordo work on a new floor. Now you would think, what in the world? What's this got to do with the sermon? Gordo on the floor. Gordo, Gordo's looking at the floor. And because God has given him an understanding of things, that a lot of us don't get. He's telling me, well, I got to do this and I got to adjust this and I got to do that. And I'm going to be honest with you, a little pride stepped in. And so I was just like, oh, yeah, mm, yeah, got it, right. Because I didn't want to admit, hey, Gordo, I don't understand a thing you're saying right now. So I just said, yeah, oh, yeah, gotcha, right. But you understand, he was gifted in such a way that he could see these problems, three, four issues down the road. He was taking care of them right here. Whereas if I was doing it, I'd be wasting half of the materials because I'd get down there and realize, oh, I've got to start over because I screwed up. And then come back, oh, I've got to start over because I screwed up. He could see it ahead. That's a gift. God gave him and he's using it. You hear what I'm saying? And I just watched and I went and I like bragged to two other people. I'm just like, it's amazing because our, our halls, I don't, you know, our halls do this. That's, that's, our, that's what our halls do. The whole way down the hall, they do this, okay? And that's not putting down people, that was all donated time when they built it and they did a great job but uh, apparently they all worked in a funny like an arcade or something because they all do this okay you know i'm talking about those mirrors 
I'm sorry, bad joke. Okay. Listen, he could see all that ahead of time. That, how come he can do that? Because that's God. He's letting God use him in those gifts that he has. And it's an awesome thing when you see it happening. And every one of us has those gifts that God's given you. And you use them, you'll do awesome things because it's God who's awesome. As the musicians come, you know what? I want to go one step farther as we close. You know the reason why so many of us, when we got saved, have never grown past where we were when we got saved? You remember when you got saved and you were super excited about asking Jesus in your heart? Or all of us 300 years old and we can't remember when we got saved? Is there, do we remember? Do you remember when you got saved and you were excited about your relationship with Jesus? Amen? I remember 1976, seven years old, Camp Sugar Pine. I remember front left. He said, I'm going to have an invitation. I got down on my knees before the music could start because the Holy Spirit was convicting me. I was seven years old, and God was saying, get your behind up there and, ask, and get in there and ask me into your heart. That's how God talks to me. Okay? And so I did. I remember that day. You remember, you know why some of us never grow past that point? I'm going to tell you right now why. Because we have never really fallen at the, neat, the feet of Jesus and admitted that we are nothing without him. Because many of us have got saved, and it's almost like, God, you lucky dog, you, I am going to be saved today. And God says, okay, you are saved, but boy, we've got a lot of work to do. And, and some of us haven't realized we're nothing without God. We think we're something special. We are nothing without God. Would you stand with me? I found a Christian author, and I, you know, sometimes when you name a Christian author, some Christians hate him, like him, you know, they're all against him. Oh, goodness, he goes to this church, and they do that, and, they, and I, uh, Christians, just chill out, okay? He's a Christian author. He's not perfect. None of us are. You hear me? None of us are. His name is Dr. Henry Cloud. He says, pride asks, who's right? Humility asks, What's right? But many of us are more concerned with us being right. Not that it is right or wrong. All we care about is that we don't look wrong or we don't want to lose face or whatever. You know what? Forget all that junk. All that matters is Jesus. You messed up. You know one of the freeing things, the most freeing things to do is say, man, I fouled that up pretty good. Thank goodness Jesus forgives and I move on. He still uses me. Amen? Amen? Let it go, people. That's what Isaiah is going to be saying to these people. Guys, all summer are going to be reading. Guys, every time you fail, it starts with your pride where you think you know better than God. You don't know what's better than God. And when you do it your way, you're going to mess up. All summer we're going to be seeing this. How about you in your life? Is that you? Do you care more about how you look and your image and your, you know, what people think about you? Or do you care about doing what God has called you to do? Care about who gets the credit? Or do you care about what has God called me to do? I don't know, whatever you're facing. Whatever it is in your life. Pride over something or maybe you haven't asked Jesus in your heart. Listen, if you haven't asked Jesus in your heart... Today is the day. It is the best day. What is today? The 11th? You will never forget 6, 11, 23 as the day you came to know Jesus as your Savior. But if you do, and you've let other things get in the way of you serving Him faithfully, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's only one way. And that's Jesus' way. Whatever's on your heart, you can pray right there where you're at, or you can come forward and just share what's on your heart as they sing.